Okay, let's get cracking. We're going to read from Haggai, or Haggai, chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. Uh, you will notice there's a little bit of overlap in the verses as we go through this series of uh, preaching. So if you're away at church weekend, don't worry. Some of this will be, have been covered last week. If you were here last week, that's fine. God sometimes takes a little while, or perhaps it's us that take a little while, to get hold of his message and let it sink into our minds. And I think this is particularly true with this message because of what it's about. So we're going to read Haggai chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourself to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, lies in ruin? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into bags with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So first I've got a question for you, and the question is, what is crunchy on the outside, but fluffy in the inside? Crunchy on the outside, fluffy in the inside, you have to cast your mind to 2020's adverts. Tonic tea cake. Tonic tea cake, that would be true, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's not though, it's McDonald's fries, apparently, advertised by an English rugby player. Okay, what film is slimy yet satisfying from? Even further back than 2020, slimy yet satisfying. Craig thinks he knows, but he just can't quite remember. It's from The Lion King, and it's Timon trying to feed bugs to Simba and trying to persuade him they're slimy yet satisfying. Okay, last question. Who is comfy but dissatisfied? But dissatisfied. And the answer is these people. So we're in the middle of a story, um, and the Israelite people have just returned from exile that you were talking about at your church weekend away. And they've come, they've been given a purpose to rebuild God's temple so that God would live amongst them, but their lives had become comfy. But yet they were dissatisfied, and they did not know. They needed God's prophet to point it out to them, to give them a bit of a wake-up call. And we'll see that God wasn't just telling them this because he wanted some rubble moved about. He needed to point it out to them so that they would realise that the way they were living, comfy, yet dissatisfied, was stalling God's much bigger plan, his plan for other people in the world. You see, there's danger in being comfy, and there's danger in being dissatisfied. Being comfortable insulates us, you know, if you sit back in a comfortable chair, all that pain that's been in your back all morning, I don't know if you can imagine this, these are not particularly comfortable. All that pain that's been in your back all day it just melts away, doesn't it? And the stiffness in your neck, you're comfortable. It insulates us from pain. And when we become uh, comfortable in our lives, it insulates us from the rest of the world around us or our problems. And like a pupil at my school where I teach after I put them in a big body beanbag to lie back, I said, ah, oh, it's quite okay. The trouble is, I just don't want to get up again. That's what comfort does, and that's what happened to these people. What about dissatisfaction? Well, especially when it comes as only that sort of foggy sense of disease that we all recognise sometimes, or the drive for more, it, we, we quickly try and cover it up. We quickly fill it with that void with 
um, other things. Things that we do automatically. Get out our phone, we flick through something. Perhaps we fill it with um, things that make us feel better. But it stops us from confronting why are we dissatisfied and dealing with it honestly. And it can push us into a deep spiral of self-preservation. So the question is, are you comfortable but dissatisfied? The Israelites were. We have to consider our ways. The devil is such a good, does such a good job at deceiving us, of us uh, being caught by self-deception. Do we need God's wake-up call? Is prophetic clarity to get our priorities and our activities sorted out. These Israelites did. Are we comfy in our lives? Are we comfy in as a church? Are we dissatisfied? What are we doing with that? So that's what we're going to look at today. But before we need, before we look at ways that we can be uh, comfortable, we need to look at why it was really important. For them to know this message. Why were they building a temple anyway? What's the temple got to do with us? We have Jesus, don't we? Going to the temple. So we're going on a whistle stop tour all the way from Eden to the present day to try and find out what this was all about. So to do that and, and to try and do it quickly, I've got some cartoons. You'll see I've not been a teacher very long. So I haven't managed to perfect the teacher handwriting yet. But we're going to start with creation. God um, made this world, he made human beings, he chose two people, he put them in this beautiful garden called Eden, this place where God was with us in perfect holiness, no separation, full relationship. Of course, as you know, we decided to do it our way. And there was no way back for humans, back to that beautiful, God with us, Eden place. There was no way back, at least for humans, to do. But God had a plan. He called a chosen people with a purpose. People where he wanted to be with, to live with them. And he got them to build first a tent, and then a temple for him to live right in the middle with them. Uh, he limited himself to being in a temple, not where a black garden where he could just walk around with humans, but he limited himself to the temple. A bit like we limit a fire to a grate in a fireplace so that it doesn't burn the whole house down. God limited himself to the temple because he wanted to live with this rebellious people, but he didn't want to destroy them with the holiness of his love. The temple was decorated, I don't know if you know this, it was decorated with um, images of Eden, palm trees, thousands of pomegranates and flowers, saying this is a place where God is with us, Eden in the midst. And then he gave them the gift of sacrifices as a way for them to come close. Still not the way it was, in a limited way, but he gave it, uh, gave him a way to come close to him. He was restoring his plan. But it wasn't just for them. Because he also gave them as the people where God was with them, with the temple, a job. They were to be light to the nations. A beacon to bring all the other nations in. What did they do? They did it their way. And again, there was separation. The temple was destroyed. The people were carried off into exile. Um, they were separated from God, but not forgotten. They were away for 70 years, but God called them back. And that's where we get to our story. He called them to return. He called them to build, rebuild, the temple so God could once again live with his presence with them. 
temple rebuild had started. Uh, and they had set up the altar and they started having sacrifices so that religious practices were up and running. The foundations were begun of the temple, but there were discouragements along the way. A long slog, opposition, even legal injunction to stop them, the temple building had ground to halt. And for the next 10 years or so, they were working on the land for food. They were doing up their houses. Wood panelling apparently was uh, the up and coming thing for uh, trendy Israelites in their houses. They were getting comfortable. Perhaps they glanced up through their window, past the panelling, to see the ruin of the temple. And as the devil said he was so good at uh, self-deception, perhaps they were saying to themselves, it's just not God's timing yet. Do we do that sometimes? That's what they said, what they said they did in verse 2, which we didn't read. Perhaps they also looked up at their panelling and said, well, I deserve a bit of luxury, don't I? I just worked so hard, and work hard they did to be self-reliant, rather than being people with God amongst them, relying on him. <coughs> but they were comfortable in another way. All the opposition had gone. They had a quiet life, they blended in. They had acceptable standards now for their neighbours that would got onto them when uh, they started building the temple. Sure, the other locals that were living there probably found their resting on the seventh day uh, a bit odd. And maybe the others didn't get the meaning of their sacrifices, but why would they reject? I mean, let everybody believe what they want to believe, as long as they don't ruffle my feathers, challenge my life. Is that what we hear uh, so often now? Do we recognise any of that without, within our culture? So comfortably, materially, uh, cult, um, in what they did, they blended in, not ruffling anyone else's feathers. Is that us? How we live? And God was waking them up. Verse 4 said, uh, Is it for your, you yourselves to live in your panelled houses when my house, the plan, is in ruin? Something was missing. Verse 6, 5 and 6 says, Consider your ways. Something was rattling their cage a little bit. Despite their comfort, they realised something wasn't quite right. But were they going to get the meaning of that? Verse 6 says, You have so much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough to drink. You never have enough. You drink, but you never uh, have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. He who earns wages, does so to put them into a bag with holes. Do we know what that feels like? No matter how much we get in, we're always giving it out. <coughs> Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Despite their comfort, there was something that was making them dissatisfied. They worked hard, but never seemed to have enough. They were stuck in the rut, in the cycle of unfulfilling self-sufficiency. Work to eat, eat to work. Sound familiar? No matter what they did, it never, they never felt that it brought in enough. And they were going through the cycle again and again. Note they were living in, in panelled houses, so this isn't just uh, uh, poverty. It's not just being self, um, uh, self uh, subsistence farming. farming. There is an addiction within that says something, not an addiction, a dissatisfaction uh, within that says something is missing for someone. So, they were comfy but dissatisfied. They were meant to be light to the nations. They were meant to rely on God with him in the centre. But they were missing something. Okay, we need to go back 
to our Eden to present day story to find out what the temple means to us. So let's go back. Now, 500 years on from our current Bible story, we're at another version of the temple, version 3 of the temple. <coughs> Jesus is there with a whip in his hands. The people again have done it their way and he's driving out the merchants who had set up shop there. In Matthew 21, Jesus said, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Mm. That's not comfortable, is it? Or fitting in. Jesus didn't do that. And not long later, on another hill, in view of the temple, Jesus hung on a cross. <coughs> and people shouted at him, saying, You said you'd tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. And his disciples remembered, or realised, that he wasn't talking about the temple, the stone temple. He was talking about his body. Jesus is the ultimate temple place where God is with us, in total holiness, sacrificing himself to allow us the way back to God. The temple has changed, but that's still not the end of the story. Because the next bit of the temple story is to do with us. See, Jesus is building his followers into the temple. You are the temple now. You're Jesus. You probably know the verse in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6. It's become a common phrase. Uh, it says, Do you not know your body is a temple? I always miss the next bit of the Holy Spirit. God within you. But it's more than that. Individually, we are temples of God. But actually, together, all the rest of the verses are together verses. God is building you, us, into the temple together. In one of Paul's really long verses, really long sentences that goes on for many verses, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, you are members of God's household. With Christ Jesus being the cornerstone, you are being joined together and being grown into the holy temple of the Lord. In him, you are being built together in this, as a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You see, church buildings are not the replacement for the Old Testament temple. We are with Jesus. It's something to remember as you build your building down the road. I'm going to take a moment to break off and talk about that just for a minute, okay? And then we'll come back to what we're talking about. When I was preparing this sermon, I was praying, God, as I drive to Edinburgh, Best thinking time driving the car. Uh, help me think about what I'm going to say in the sermon. I was going to listen to the verses and um, uh, some podcasts. Got to Stonehaven, connection between my phone and the radio broke. <coughs> uh, on came Radio 4. And, and God can speak through um, talking donkeys, can't he? So he hopefully can speak through Radio 4. And on comes uh, Radio 4, and it's a program about architects and social housing. And I had to listen to this until I got to Dundee. Um, but there were some interesting things, and I want to just share them with you because there must be some reason I had to listen to that. You can decide for yourselves, test it for yourselves. But the message from that story was that buildings are important. I'm sure you know that because you're investing your time and money in new buildings. For the people of Kintore. 
it matters what it's like because it changes how people perceive the people that go into, people outside perceive what goes inside. What a building is like inside makes you feel, the people that go there feel different. Changes their attitude. And the main thrust of this program was to say, the architects, the people doing the designing and the planning, need to listen to the people who use the building because it can make a huge difference to their lives. So as you're considering your building, are you listening to each other? You're obviously going to use the building. Are you listening to what God says is his building, to what he wants you to do with it? And you're listening to a community that I know you hope to serve and defend for what will be helpful to them. Okay, Gospel Gordon's Radio 4 finished, and we'll go back to the sermon. <laughs> but I just wanted to pass that on. I don't know if that was of any benefit, but there you go. Okay, church buildings are not the replacement for the Old Testament temple. We are. But they were missing the point of their vocation, rebuilding the temple, being light to the world. Are we too comfortable in our lives or filling our discontentedness with other stuff that we don't notice whether we're fulfilling our job as being God's temple? Are we too blended into our culture for other people to notice that there's a temple standing right next to them when we're with them? Have we forgotten the purpose of being a temple, which is to be light to the nations, to the people outside the walls of the more building of the road? When you're at work, can the person down the corridor from you know that they're standing next to the temple when they talk to you? Can the person that goes to your Pilates class, or um, the person that uh, is at the checkout at the co-op down the road, do they know they're meeting the temple where God is inside and God wants them to know Him? Or does the person whose life is broken not need the happy songs that we sing? Need that temple to bend down beside them and to get on our knees and to show grace and the compassion of the God within us to them so that they can see God. There's a difference between the old temple and us as a temple. The temple couldn't move, could it? People had to come to the temple. But we can move. In fact, we're told to move. Go into all the world. Go everywhere. Preach the good news. Teach people how to be disciples. Baptize them. We are temples on the move. We come in and gather. We go out. Temples on the move. But what does it mean to be a temple? Well, at its simplest, a temple is a place where people can meet God. And people meet God when they meet you. Jesus, when he was clearing out the temple, he said, My house should be a house of prayer. Are we praying? All the time, it talks about. We're starting our day saying, God, your priorities today, not mine. Bring the people you want me to meet today. Help me to lay aside things that are busy if there's something else you need me to do. And we pray. These are the verses from Isaiah that Jesus took that house of prayer apart from. And I've just put, pulled out a few of those verses and, and words in bold just to pick out some other ideas of what the temple is about. These verses were part of a story of a 
uh, God wanting to bring all nations to his holy mountain, to the, where the temple was. It was holy. Are we being holy? Those verses about our bodies at temple was about <coughs> purity. Are we showing that in what we show to people? We are called to be different. Are we joyful? It's hard to be joyful in the daily grinds, isn't it? Same old, same old every day. But are we joyful? Huh? We'll come back to sacrifices in a minute. But we're called to be a temple for all people. God gathers in the outcasts, he wants to. He gathers in yet others. As you move up the road, as you've got a few more weeks here, God wants to gather more people in. As churches grow and as they change, and as people come who are not like us, and they should come, people not like us, that makes us uncomfortable. It's not the same as when it's small. It's not the same when people are not the same as us. Are we going to allow ourselves to be uncomfortable because God loves other people? And then there also talks about being a place of acceptable sacrifices. Of course, that was the old system it was talking about. And Jesus is now our sacrifice, our atoning sacrifice, so that we can come into God's presence. That's what we're offering to people. So you know it also talks about us being acceptable sacrifices in, uh, in the New Testament, doesn't it? Uh, living, breathing sacrifices in everything we do, being for other people, for God. Are we doing that? You see, the temple is a place of grace, not judgment. When I talked about us fitting in and or whether we fitted in too easily, when we talk about going against the flow, standing up in our culture, how many of us quickly jump to the things that we should stand up and protest about? Things that we think are going wrong in our society and we should say things about. There is place for that. But that's not our first role as a, as a temple. Our first role is to bring God's grace. People should see God's grace when they look at us. Grace to get alongside and show them God. I'm still thinking what that means since I spoke this sermon last week. This is a new bit I've just put in. Still working out what that means. And I'm hoping that as we listen together, this is a slow burn message. Comfy yet dissatisfied. It's not something we go, hey, I'm comfy, I'm going to change. God needs to work on us with this over a number of weeks. How do we show God's grace to a broken world? So, let's consider our ways as we get towards wrapping this up. Firstly, individually. Are you comfortable? Am I comfortable? All of us are materially. If you have a toilet, you are more comfortable than a third of the world's population. We are all comfortable in some way. But are we comfortable in our lifestyle? Remember, comfort insulates us from discomfort. What are we missing? Because we're happy with how we, how we live, with what we do. Is our Bible reading time with Jesus just a little psychological fix in the morning to make us feel better and ready for the day? Are our prayers just a shopping list for our own needs? Perhaps there are other ways God wants to wake us up, to show us where we're comfortable, and show us what it's shielding us from. Will you ask God to do that? To wake us up? Or are you dissatisfied? Dissatisfaction is not wrong. 
There's sermons coming about that in the next couple of weeks. It's what we do with it that's the problem. What we think it means, what we do to get rid of it from ourselves. Are we trapped in the hand-to-mouth daily grind every day? Homework, school, jobs, nappies, school run, or the mundaneness of everything being the same when you get up every morning? Are we filling the hole in the pain with addiction? Addiction to our phone, just the coloured lights, addiction to other things that are perhaps maybe more serious, that damages our health or relationships. Dare we ask God to show us the real reasons behind that discomfort and find forgiveness and healing? It's not about being perfect by being eternal. Okay? We are still being built. In fact, one of the best ways to show people God is to be open and vulnerable about the things that are not perfect in our lives and how God is helping us with those or changing us. So individually, comfort, dissatisfied. What about as a church? Now, I don't know most of you very well up here. Um, but God is building you as a people, as part of the worldwide temple. But are you comfortable? Will you get comfortable when you, work, when you move up the road? You know, we have money in the bank as a, as a group of churches. We have buildings. We have a style of worship that's easy to listen to, to join in and enjoy. We have preaching that fills us with knowledge. Is our comfort of the way we do church, even just the routine of coming every week, blinding us to what is going on outside the church, in our city, in our country, in our world? Scotland is the fastest secularising com- country in, in the West. We need to know and realise what is going on. The spiritual emptiness, or actually now the search for something spiritual, but looking in a different place. Poverty, the mental health crisis, um, the very real likelihood that people round about us that we know and care about, and those we barely know, won't be in the new Eden, unless we are templing together properly. Are we comfortable as a church, but being self-reliant? You know, most folk are good at doing stuff. They do it in their jobs. Or they're good with their hands. We all have gifts to bring to work together. But are we self-reliant? Do we forget to actually check what God wants? And it might look very different to what we think of church. There's a challenge somebody gave me after I preached this at Jared Street. He didn't think I'd, I'd said enough about this. But coming from a third world perspective, or two thirds world perspective, because there's more of them than one of us, how is it that church in this area, in this side of the world, is not growing, or at least growing very slowly, when we have so much? But yet, in Africa, in South America, it's growing like this when they have so little. What are we missing? So comfortable. As a temple together, are we dissatisfied? Do we feel stuck? Are we find it difficult with decision making or in the ways we do things? We're stuck in a rut of this is how it always is. Do we feel dissatisfied that Whatever we've tried to do to reach out, there's still a poor harvest, like the verses, if you take them metaphorically from today, of people coming in, of becoming Christians, maybe you tell your friends, and nobody really changes. We're supposed to be dissatisfied. But what does that drive us to? Is it driving us to be a house of prayer, to pray and to change? So, What do we do about it? 
We need to take time to consider your ways. It took them eight weeks, I think. No, four months. Sermon series is eight weeks. Four months to get from this message to building. So over the course of this sermon series, will we consider our ways in a way that makes change for how we are as a church together? Ask God to show us our comfort and our discomfort. Yes, even ask for discomfort and dissatisfaction and for God's prophetic <laughs> word to reveal to us what we need to make our response as. We may certainly need to confess, because we all get this wrong. And we definitely need to surrender to be temples filled with God's presence every day. So that's the challenge. Are we comfort, comfortable? Dissatisfied? Are we considering our ways? Are we being temple to other people where God can see us? I'm going to finish with a, word, with a verse from Habakkuk, I think. I forgot to write it down. <laughs> because it's easy to hear a message like this and say, we've just got to try hard. That's not the message. The message is, are we surrendering to God and trust Him that God, this is a prayer God loves to answer. The verse says, I am the one who answers your prayers and cares for you. This has been a long-term goal, a long-term project for God, even to now, to the future. God wants to build us to be a light to the nations. And that's what I would say. I think Colin's going to lead us uh, in some songs. Do you want me to pray, Colin, or do you want to pray? I'll pray. Okay. Lord, very simply, we want to bow before you as your creation, as your people. And uh, we want to ask you to reveal to us where we have become too comfortable that we're missing what is going on around us. Is missing the people that you want to draw into your kingdom through us. Please show us our comfort and help us to be willing to stand up for that beanbag that feels so comfy to change. And Lord, show us our dissatisfaction, whether it's dissatisfaction uh, that we have created ourselves or dissatisfaction in us that you are creating and draw us to you. Put in us the desire to have your plans first and fill us with your Holy Spirit.